All right. Well, <laughs> yay, we're all on. Um, I am so excited to be here with you guys tonight. For everyone who doesn't know me, my name is Stephanie. I'm the co-founder of Quell. Um, and every day I feel extremely proud to represent this roster. Um, they are just honestly so amazing. I'm able to amplify their stories and experiences and um, expertise. And so um, this is just another way of being able to tap into their amazingness. So tonight we have uh, Bashir Munye, Tafik Shahada, and Ryan Hinkson, your regular host. Um, we're turning the tables and I'm going to host tonight. Um, so let's just, just get right into it. I mean... This year, this month, this week, yesterday was such a heavy day. Um, and, you know, as adults, I think we, we find ways to cope, right? We find ways to deal with it and try to make sense of things. Um, but this is really about our children. All of us here have kids, um, you know, from little babies to, to adolescents and, and men and women, right? Men. Um, and so... How do we help our children, you know, go through, like, cope and, again, try to make sense of things? And that's partly why we're here tonight. You know, really, how do we ensure that we raise kind and compassionate humans? Um, you know, how are we helping them to understand that they are more than? So, you know, as I said, for me, you know, I was raised in an immigrant family and, um, I didn't have the talks with my parents the way that I have talks with my children now. So, you know, that's kind of where I want to start with everyone here. And so, you know, pandemic aside for now, because that just adds another layer of craziness. But, um, you know, talk to me about your kids and, and how you're handling kind of talking to them and teaching them about stuff like BLM and anti-Asian hate, uh, white supremacy, misogyny. Like, these are big topics that have come up a lot and consistently because... This thing's real, right? It's happening. It's out there. So maybe I'll put it to you guys. Who wants to start? Let, let's start with the people that are the oldest in the room. <laughs> the 50-year-old? That, <clears throat> thanks, for sure. Thank you. <laughs> it's supposed to be the most wisdom. Most wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I meant. <laughs> I mean, well, for me... It, in some ways, I don't want to say it's, it's easy because it's certainly not easy, but um, because I experienced, you know, uh, not a ton, but I experienced quite a few things uh, when, I, when I was younger. Whenever my kids see something and if they're not commenting on it in a sort of affirmative, positive way, I talk to them about, hey, these things happen to your dad. Your dad was made fun of because of, and and I have, you know, unlike Bashir or Ryan, or Ryan, I was, I don't want to say more different, but I didn't fit into a mold. I wasn't black. I wasn't black. I wasn't white. I wasn't quite dark enough brown. It, actually, in high school, they used to call me dark white. Um, so it was very, because I didn't fit into a mold, people didn't know, I guess, what racial epithets to call me. So when, I, when, I, when I'm talking to my kids, I can say to them, you know, when they say something, I can say, here's what happened to daddy when he was little. You know, here's, here's the things that were said about your dad because my lunch didn't look like other kids' lunch. You know, our food didn't smell like other people's food. So I can catch them early and share stories with them. And, you know, I guess, you know, much like Bashir, through food, we can tell our, our children stories about other cultures, right? So... When I cook, I cook all sorts of food. If there's a story behind that food, if, if there's a, an, a cultural or ethnic importance to that food, I'll tell the kids stories about it. You know, like when Chinese New Year came up, we made a Chinese New Year dinner. And we talked about the importance of Chinese New Year's. We read Chinese New Year's books. Right now I'm talking to them about Ramadan. Uh, my kids have an Arabic tutor who's Muslim. I'm Christian. And so next week in their Arabic class, they're only going to learn the Arabic words about Ramadan and what Ramadan means in our so i think i don't want to say it's easier but because i've experienced it i can head it off at the pass quicker for them because i did i didn't have that growing up we just had to accept that we are different from them and that's it move on you're never going to be accepted move on you're just different 
Hmm. So I did a similar, I guess, kind of in between scenario as both of you, Seth and Tafik. Um, on one hand, like the the type of conversation that I know I'm going to be preparing to have with the uh, 16 month year old when it's time and that I have with my stepdaughter who's in her 20s are, are far different. Um, with my parents, you know, they were very vocal about <clears throat> uh, my standing and how I'd be seen and treated in this world as a black man. And they, they didn't pull any punches about uh, what was to be expected and how I, how I should act. Um, you know, and that at my young age, because they, they, they didn't really wait on it. You know, it was very important for them to communicate, um, you know, what the world was like through, at least through their eyes. Um, and that was heavy for me at that time. And I only can imagine when we add in all of the layers of, of today, not that, you know, racism or anything was easier before, but it's coming at us differently. And there's a lot more noise. There's a lot more voices. And even just that veil, though, although it wasn't healthy or protective, the veil of taboo that people used to kind of skate around is even gone. So you've got people who are celebrated and lifted up for being negative, for being evil, and have no fear of retribution for spewing that, you know, whether it's online, in person, um, wrapping their, their arms around a sense of, of wrongness, or at least what I feel is wrong. So uh, I, I, I'm a little anxious. <laughs> it might even play out in my voice right now because I, you know, like Avery's 15 months old, right? Like the conversation's still a little bit out there. And I, I just see things kind of going at this crazy pace from where we're at to worse. You know, you know we, we could try to celebrate little moments like yesterday, but I mean, I think it shines more of a light on how much more is to be done. So for myself, um, yeah, it, it, it's very trying because, um, you know, what I, what I experienced, what I was prepared to deal with just seems to be even more so illuminated. Um, and ironically, um, although we ha we're, we're in a space where there are a lot more people who may be kind or, or caring or aware, or at least trying to learn, an anti-racist stance, the intensity with which this is thrust upon us is is very intense. Uh, the intensity is intense. Um, but yeah, I, so I, 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 I've i been, before she was born, I've been crafting the talks in my mind. You know, it's, it's, it's a lie. Yeah. And so going from Ryan to Bashir, I mean, you have an adolescent and a young woman at home. How is it, how has it been? Like, how does it change? How's the, does the narrative, like, how does the language change? How does the teachings change? You know, <clears throat> I, I, I want to take a moment to, to what both uh, Tofik and Ryan said about their own personal experience and sharing the experience with their own kids. So for myself, I grew up in Italy and in Italy, it's, an, it's a country that is based on fascism, they colonize Italy. So the, to be called the N word to me was very familiar. So when somebody will use the N word, I will turn around in a very casual way thinking that that was my first name. That's how many times that I got called. And I spoke that to my kids as well because they, they were born in Canada, they're Canadians, and they identify themselves with this particular space. So my own narrative, sometimes we joke about it, or there is a lot of a humor about my own childhood upbringing, growing up being a, a really, really dark, dark, dark Italian guy. Um, but the reality is that I wasn't that dark Italian guy. I was a black person, but growing up, I really identified myself within that culture. So there is some layers of a complexity when it comes about identity and how you share your own identity to your own kids. So for myself, born in Mogadishu, Somalia, lived in Italy, been, been, uh, lived in the States, been in Canada, at times, just like Tofik, I had a really difficult time identifying myself as one particular dimension. You know, because I'm not Somali enough, because it's not my first language, it's not the culture that I grew up. I'm not Italian enough because Italian skin complex show that, you know, they tell me, you know, you're not Italian. I wasn't African American enough because, you know, I had a jerry curl and I wear tons of a cologne and I had a slang that other other African Americans wouldn't understand. Can, can you share I'm some of those Canada, pictures? I, I've been asking I'll, for I'll those pictures. I'll share some of the features. <laughs> I've been asking for those pictures to feed. We need to see it. Yeah. Something has to be done. We do. 
I, I, would, I would pictures. prove to everybody that at one point in my life I did have a hair and I did have an Italian swag. But you know, I shared that with my kids with a lot of you. And at times it is a little bit that that it, it kind of hurts when we joke about those issues. There are elements of a tenderness that kind of like still are uh, raw inside, but we have a healthy conversation in our home. Now, in my home, I'm very privileged because I have my wife that, you know, really ground us all together. We have like a healthy conversation around, you know, gender, identity, uh, and how do we respond? Actually, you know, when I met my wife, you know, she had a friends that come in from so many um, uh so many parts of the world, but also like identifying themselves within the LGBTQ. So there's been a lot of a growth for me. So as much as I am uh, learning or uh, as much as I'm sharing my knowledge and experience with my own kids around difficult conversations, you know, in our home, there is a lot of a conversation that is led by my wife, but also allows me to learn on how to engage my own kids as well. Because I grew up in a boarding school without a father, without a mother. So my own understanding of a parenting, it's quite, short compared to what other people have experienced having father and mother that raised them to become the people that we wish them to be. So I think those are some of the conversation. Now, the youngest daughter, the 14 year old daughter, um, it's difficult, it's, it's a bit different to teach her versus the, the, the 20 and the 22 year old. You know, the information has already been given there and they've been around other people that really help them shape. The 14 year old, she's like constantly around us and now she has the older siblings that they also provide a lot of information as well. That's great. Yeah, I, you know, I, I was sharing with you guys earlier that, you know, I think kids are so, they, you know, you, my, I have a six year old and a nine year old and, you know, my nine year old, um, has recently, uh, you know, had an incident at school and, you know, the, the a bunch of girls kind of kept on saying to him, we hate China, we hate China, and was very consistent and frequent to saying that to him. And, you know, he, he, he stood up and he spoke out and he said, you know, you guys are rude and this is, this is racist and told the teacher and it became, you know, a lecture, which was awesome on the teacher's part. You know, but I was telling you guys that, you know, I haven't really had, you know, it's not like we've sat him down and had that serious conversation about what does racism mean and, you know, uh, you know how to act upon it and what you need to do. But I know that he's listening all the time because my husband and I are always talking about it. And we teach them, right, to understand that, you know, there's, uh, you know, showing them literature about what anti-racism means or anti-oppression or gender-based or LGBTQ. And we continue, like you guys, right, you just continually show them so that it becomes normalized because, unfortunately... As a child, for me, growing up, what was normal was white princesses, right? What was, what was normal was the same type of person that I saw in every single book and every single movie that I watched. So I, I, I want to make sure, my husband, I want to make sure that that doesn't happen with our children, that they do see representation. And, you know, one of the most satisfying things that I've been hearing lately is every time I've been reading a book to my daughter, who's six, she goes, mommy, that looks like me. Like, that's the best thing that you can hear from your child because I know personally, I never got that, right? It's like, oh, okay, that's Norm. That's the hero. So, you know, I guess I pose it to you guys. You know, ha have your children gone through anything very similar where you're just aha moment where they stood up or they did something that you're just like, yes, right. You know, I'm, I'm doing well as a parent. Yeah. Um, my uh, my stepdaughter, who, like I said, is in her, uh, her early 20s, she's... Um, Man, it's it's so incredible to watch her um, throughout, especially throughout these last couple years. Um, you know, her fire for what's right, um, what's just, uh, is is like you you couldn't put it out. You could you could throw it in the ocean and it would not ex in extinguish. You know what I mean? Um, whether it comes to to race, gender bias, all all sorts of things. Um, I mean, you know, she taught me about proper pronouns before anyone was throwing them in their IG bios. And um, just over the summer, when COVID was kind of first starting, she was uh, she was just across the street, and we're we're at Bayview and Shepherd, and so we're right across from Bayview Village. And this is right when you know everyone's trying to figure things out. So, like, can you be in the mall? Can you not be in the mall? What what are the the you know the rules? And everyone, you know, we try to give each other a little bit of kindness at this time because everyone's kind of on edge. Everybody's figuring things out. 
Um, but you know, sometimes when there's things that are just like blatantly racist to blatantly racist. So um, she was waiting for her mom, my wife, at she was waiting inside of the mall. My, my wife was in a store uh, just getting something, and I guess they were limiting the amount of people that could come in. So she was just on a bench. Um, Security's walking up and down, you know, and uh, ask her, you know, pass a white couple on the way to her who had been sitting there longer than she was standing and asked her, you know, same kind of profile and stuff. What are you doing here? Like, why are you in the mall? Uh, I'm waiting for my mom. What's your mom doing? Like all this litany of questions. Um, and, you know, and she handled, uh, like, I, I'm getting the phone call on the way home. So I'm thinking, oh, I got to go to the mall now and like soldier up. But then we get further into the conversation and she tells me, what she says to him and, and quickly and promptly took this guy to school, um, had him properly embarrassed and, you know, fixed the situation in a manner in which I wasn't um, just proud because she stood up for herself. But, you know, she was able to identify something as dangerous as, as profiling, because, I mean, a lot of times you could just say, oh, hey, you know, he's just doing his job. But for her to be able to observe and take in the fact that he wasn't questioning anybody else, um, that she had been there the shortest amount of time, those are moments that it's weird. You get a sense of pride when you know your kids can handle themselves. However, you never want your kids to be in a situation where they have to handle themselves. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, you know, on any given day, she could be wearing Jordans as fresh as mine or a baseball cap like mine. And I, you know, want for her that she doesn't have to worry about, you know, uh, what she's wearing on a day, what she looks like, how she presents um, in order to enjoy the same comforts and respects that anybody else does. Um, so, you know, it, it's really, really big when you see your kids um, taking in what you've, you've tried to, to teach them, you know. You guys have any comments to that? Well, I yeah, think I have a, you know, <laughs> I, I think as I mentioned to you before, Stephanie and uh, Brian as well, you know, uh, we have, uh, with my youngest daughter, we have our nighttime drive routine. So we take about an hour, an hour and a half, uh, four to five nights a week. We go for a drive. She has a chance to blast any music that she wants to. I promise myself not to make any comments about the music that she listens. <laughs> If she wants to undertone uh, cast and curse, she's free to do that. She can open her, you know, can open the window. She can use her camera and do whatever that she wants. So that's the hour and a half of bonding for us. It helps both of us with our mental health and leaving the house in a healthy way as well. So throughout the question that you have to ask, the, the question that we ask ourselves sometimes as a parent is like, how many times do our racialized kids experience a racism or prejudice and how do we confront those things? And when those things that are happening in the car while I'm with my daughter, what are my responsibilities as a parent, as a black parent specifically, to stay cool, to stay composed, to, to keep her reassured, considering all the things that are constantly happening to black people all the time. And in her psyche, there is this, this some under under undertone of a you know you know a communal trauma that we all experiencing. So my responsibility is to ensure that you know don't worry about it. Everything is okay and everything is cool. Although inside, I'm feeling a variety of feelings. You know, why is this happening to me right now? Why is this? Why is that? Simple things. So a simple example: we went to the doctor a couple of days ago. Uh, because the doctor can only see one patient at a time, there is a note outside that he says, ring the bell and just wait five minutes, right? Just, we might be busy with other things as well. So my daughter and I will ring the bell, nine o'clock in the morning, we sit down, we wait, nine or eight, I say, nobody's here, let's go and ring the bell. The, the, we rang the door again. The, 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 the person in the front desk came, you know, she didn't smile at us, and I was like, okay, I was like, hey, good morning, Lula has an appointment at nine o'clock, and she says, uh, you are late, and I'm like, oh, we actually rang the bell, and I, and I said, no, no, we came at nine o'clock, she's like, hey, well, you didn't ring the bell, I was like, no, we actually rang the bell, there is a sign there that it says, just wait five minutes, so the way she's responding to me, how does my daughter translate? So she asked me after all of those things. So we had gone and spoke with the doctor. She, she had a visit with the doctor in the consultation. And then I explained my disdain about that person's behavior in front of my daughter while I was staying calm and paused, right? Although inside I was really, really upset and I wanted to, 
to really give her, you know, a mouthful of what I was feeling, but to teach my daughter a lived experience right there at that moment. I spoke with the doctor and said, I have this kind of a disdain for this person. They're really trying to shame, humiliate publicly my daughter and I for something that we haven't done at all. Usually when you work in the hospitality industry, you greet someone, hello, good morning, how are you, can I help you? We didn't get any of the greetings, right? So I explained that to the doctor and then I, I'm gonna ask the doctor, what are you gonna do to ensure that this person doesn't conduct that way to the same people that they're serving. So when we left, my daughter asked me, dad, did you think that she's behaving like this to us only, or do you think she's behaving like this to everybody? And she said to me, I hope she's behaving like this to everybody. I don't know if it's a good hope or a great wish, but that's make a 14 year old think because of I'm black now, you are treating me in this particular way. So do I deny her own experience? Do I try to justify and validate? Maybe this person is having a bad day. Maybe this, maybe that. Or do I confront for what it is? So now I'm, I'm left with this kind of perplexed question, you know? And do I want my child to grow up with a lot of people they say, you know, you got a chip on your shoulder. Because the lived experience of racialized communities that constantly we are humiliated, degraded, you know, we are constantly bombarded with a lot of negativism, it is very easy for us to feel, I say, where is it? Wait, 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 wait a moment. I'm trying to find, uh, I think I left it downstairs, my black man card. You know, I don't usually <laughs> carry me for those. Every now and then when I go to public spaces, you know, very rarely I bring my black man card out. But if I, if I bring my black man card out, you know for sure that that's, that's the reason why you behave like that toward me. So my, <laughs> the question is like, how many experiences do we want to give to other people? How many, how many examples do we want to give it to other people, the experience of racialized kids? And how do we as parents confront in a way that is healthy, to assure them that they're loved? And the experiences of somebody, it doesn't mean as I said that everyone in that particular way. But what are her rights now to be able to confront in a way that is also healthy toward this person? Should my daughter not go to her and says, you know what, you're being really mean. You're nasty. I don't really like your behavior. Is suddenly this woman going to go call the police on my daughter? Because now my daughter is asserting herself. So those are some of the complexity that we are confronting while we are trying to stay positive yeah. and trying to educate our kids. Yeah, that's a very important point that Bashir is making. The duality of having to be someone that's not terrifying your child and at the same time shining enough light on reality so that they're well equipped to handle it. You know, it's like you don't want to like, you know, almost like good cop, bad cop, your kid, you know what I mean? When you're parenting um, and that, that's a freedom that's not afforded, afforded to racialized groups. It's, it's just not, you know, um, um, it just, you know, yesterday's news um, kind of shadowed with what happened to Micaiah Bryant, like as a parent, like I'm, it's it's crazy to me, you know, like she called for help. Um, whether it's jokingly or very seriously, my friends and I, my family and I, we talk about the level of um, hurt or crime that we would personally put up with uh, before calling the police. You know, like, and I'm, I'm dead serious. Like I, I literally have probably a number, like a dollar amount of damage I would allow to like my personal property before I call police. Mm -hmm. um, most people don't think like that. Most people would never like, and you shouldn't have to, for all intents and purposes, worry. Like, you should be able to call. You know what I mean? That's the right thing to do. She called, right? Like, it, th that, I don't, I really hope that the takeaway from individuals is like, um, you know, parenting is very difficult. You could have great circumstances, you know, income to the roof, uh, be in the best school, and it still comes with a ton of, you know, puzzles and, and add that layer of um, figuring out how much trauma you give your kid without them even experiencing it necessarily, preparation for it, and how much Walt Disney you give them. They're kids, and they deserve it. You know what I mean? So it's 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 difficult. Um, and you know, based on what what both of you said, um, with Bashir saying about about his daughter, 
it's also, it's not like us when we were growing up. They have access to media. So Bashir can talk to his 14-year-old daughter about, you know, this person is doing this or this person is doing that. Stand up for yourself. But at the same time, they're seeing the news that a young girl called a cop and the cop shot her. Right? So it's like, well, do it. And le like you said, Ryan, they're, they're sort of, there's injustices we're willing to take because it's like, well, what are we going to do? Because that that's the situation we're in. Because if you call the cops, it, it may get worse. And we have to live with that reality. When I was growing up, and I mean, you're younger, you think, you know, it, you think it makes you cooler. If I got pulled over by the cops after dark, which I did, I was always speeding and whatever, um, I would get pulled over and the cop would have his gun out when I got pulled over. If one of my friends was driving, there would be no gun, but there would be a cop standing at my window, right? The cop would come out, uh, you know, a white friend was driving, the cop would go back to his car and then another cop would come stand on my side. But when I was driving, a cop would come to a gun to my window. No one comes to the window of the white guy next door sitting next to me, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a very hard conversation to have because you want to empower them, but of course we would never put them in harm's way. And who knows what that line is? You can never know, right? You can never know if you're, if you're, you know, you tell them, stand up for yourself. But then let's say, you know, in, in Bashir's example, let's say the, the, the receptionist, she decides to call the police because she feels his daughter's being belligerent and Bashir doesn't happen to be with her at that time. That could, that could go bad really quickly and for no reason. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's very tough. And I'm, you know, I don't know if it's fortunate or unfortunate. I'm in a little bit of a different situation. My partner's Canadian. My kids are, are white. They're light skinned. Right. So my conversations about racism with them are not the same as the conversations you're going to have with your kids. You know, I, I don't, I, I would hate to think that my kids will have white privilege, but they are essentially white. You know, they have, they have my features, they have curly hair, you know, but they are white. So it, it's, it's very different for me. And I, I'm, I, I don't know if this is a terrible thing to say, but I'm glad they're not going to have to deal with the injustices that I, I had to deal with. Right. So it's, it's strange. Like you don't want to, I mean, you're thankful that your kids don't have to deal with this, but at the same time, you know, there's so many other people that have to deal with this. So, you know, in some senses I have to work harder to make sure that they accept everyone equally, but I don't have the same stresses that you will have having black children. Right. Right. And I, I mean, I, I, I totally get that. It's almost, I guess, kind of like a, almost like a survivor's remorse type thing. But again, like I, as accepting as I am of what I have to go through, it doesn't mean I want anybody else to have to go through it. I would love, you know, uh, empathy, right? And for people to understand it and try to work through to see it. But yeah, you don't want anyone going through it. Like, we're not trying to, you know, ha say that like everyone needs tra trauma or torture. We're, we're talking about the uh, alleviation of it. I mean, navigating these circumstances is, is interesting. And I know like policing uh, is a very, very hot button issue as it, as it should be. But, you know, Bashir's point um, about the, the incident at the, the doctor's office, it plays out in so many scenarios. I remember just prior, uh, really quickly, prior to Avery being born, um, you know, dealing with all the natural emotions and excitements and fears that an expectant parent had. I, one of the things that was like super real in my head, and some people might say it's, you know, paranoia or you're focused on the wrong thing. But I was like, oh man, like, you know, our uh, OB was off. So we knew we were definitely not gonna have our OB. And um, my, my prayer was like, oh man, I just hope I don't get like a racist nurse or a racist doctor because Again, like my wife's going to be in a lot of emotional situations, physical situations. Like this is the most important thing that can happen. And say, you know, say you're dealing with like a rude nurse or doctor. And do I have the liberty to like be stern with them because I need like their best, um, you know, work to happen. I need their, their I need a great environment, all these things. 
And then I'm thinking, like, just please don't have a racist person deal with me today. I can deal with racism every day, but not today. Because, like, I, I wouldn't know how to manage it, right? Like, these are, are, like, reoccurring things that kind of just, like, you, you stick it in a pocket and you live your day with it. And you never want that to bleed down to your kids. But, I mean, I, I'd rather them be um, armed with awareness than to be smacked in the face with reality. Yeah, and that, that's, that's a crappy reality that... If we, in certain situations, if, if we stand up for ourselves, then there's, I don't want to say there's consequences, but people are not going to treat us, oh, you know, he's talking back to me, he's this, he's this, he's this. It's like, well, you weren't treating me as an equal, and I was pointing out what you were doing, but they're in a position to make that worse, right? And, and it's the same with police, it's the same with anyone in authority. It's like, well, if I tell you, well, that's not an acceptable way to treat me, I will not be treated that way. It's like, yeah. oh, you're, act, you know, whether they say it or not, you know, it's going through, oh, you're acting pretty uppity. It's like, yeah. no, no, we are equal. And let's move on from that point. Treat me that way or, you know, <laughs> or this conversation is going, is going nowhere good and, and it'll go that way fast. Right. Yeah. So, um, I wanted to, to shift conversations a little bit more to daughters. You guys all have a daughter. Um, you know, that's why I don't have any more hair. <laughs> <laughs> My shotgun is clean, right? Yeah. In case any of these boys come around knocking on the door looking for them. But mm -hmm. at the same time, I pulled all my hair. What other questions are there for me, Stan? <laughs> So, yeah. I, I can lend you some more to pull out. If you need more to pull out. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to do a talk on hair. Oh, my goodness. There's white hair, too. Um, Ryan, hey, hey, hey. Easy there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, oh, I, I think Bashir just shaved because the other day he had a little bit. And I was like, oh, some whiteness going on there. <laughs> it's still there. It's still there. No, no one's ever. Mm -hmm. Bashir, I don't think anyone's ever accused you of whiteness before. <laughs> that's a good one that's a good one i gotta take it i gotta take with it oh thank you you see uh, chef can you read there still handsome through chef thank you thank you thank you thank you people they, they, don't, they don't even see my whiteness so they, they just see my glow go ahead Steph. It's your baby face your baby face that's your thank line you. <laughs> Um, Thank you. you know, Ryan had talked a lot about conversations that, you know, he's been preparing a lot before Avery was even born, um, you know, and so maybe this is more for uh, for Bashir as well as Tafik, but Bashir, because your, your girls are much older, um, you know, what are what are things that, you know, before having a daughter, you know, you kind of go through all these things, like make sure I have a shotgun, you know, jokingly, but, you know, things that you want to prepare your child for, but obviously once you have your daughter and, you know, you go through all these experiences, the conversations change like do you find have your conversations changed have you feel like you've had to you know uh speak to her more on certain things just based on what the world is right now oh uh, yes and no and I explain you yes because uh, you know I've, I've learned in a house ruled by a woman right so now my son is not at home so i have like a three woman in my own home I've learned that sometimes uh, explaining, it, it turned out to be this new term. What is it called? Mansplaining. Mansplaining. <laughs> so I, I, I took the, the liberty to play the, to play the fifth and not make many comments about it. But I do speak with uh, specifically with Lula, the 14-year-old, about some of my own opinion. We were talking about music, music as an example, you know? And sometimes the music they should listen, it's something that I didn't really feel comfortable as a father, as a man being with my daughter listening to particular lyrics right and i was like oh my gosh please stop and please whatever you do don't sing along no no one i'm what no one i'm there and, uh, you know so i think that you know because i come from a place of a patriarchal culture you know in in my country primarily men like many other parts of the world men had set particularly the tone on what woman could be or should be doing and so forth so i'm privileged enough to have my wife that really gives me to keep me grounded and help me understand about the advocacy for the woman is always better led by a woman the father can play a particular significant role by action but there are certain particular conversations that i really leave upon them for my wife to actually 
to tell them about it because I'm really not the expert in many of those conversations. But when it comes about having a normal conversation about anything in life, we can be pretty bonded. But when it comes about, you know, I feel that many times a conversation woman to woman can be much better than a, you know, mother to mother to daughter than a father to daughter. Yeah. That's been my personal experience in my own home, because otherwise I get my ass kicked too. I gotta keep. <laughs> I'm glad you recognize um, that. Well, <laughs> absolutely. My my daughter my daughter is younger than than Bashir's. My daughter's only eight. Um, and unlike Bashir, I'm I'm not a minority in my own home. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I I agree with most of what Bashir said. But I also think that, and I know you have your time with her. You know your hour and a half every evening, which I think is fantastic. Um, but I think it's also important for girls to see that equality coming from a male perspective, right? My mm -hmm. my son and my daughter. My my son wears jewelry. He wears necklaces. He you know he's younger than my daughter, so he looks up to her. You know he does. They do like play doh nails and all of that stuff. That's totally fine. When I'm doing renovations around the house, my daughter has her. Her own tool belt. She has her own sanding block. If I'm drywalling, she sands the drywall for me. There, I don't look at, and and neither does my partner. It's not he does one thing, she does one thing. They both do everything, and we try to, we try not to see or not to show them that we that they are different. We don't treat either of them different. Um, you know, we have, and it which, in some ways, complicates things because my son looks up to his sister. And so when he goes to school, it's actually not my my daughter has a problem. It's my son, you know, because he his sister wears pink. He wants to wear pink. Sure, wear pink. I don't care. Wear whatever you want. You know, he wants to walk around in his mother's shoes. Go walk around in your mother's shoes. Not a big deal. But so the the equality part with my daughter, I, I'm not going to say it's it's easy, but she she's still young. We do talk about equality. You know, um, you know, we've talked to her about Rosa Parks, and we've talked to her about all, all these women in history that have done things, and we've explained to her why it's a big deal, because women couldn't do these things. And, you know, my, my mom, she moved out of her, in Egypt, she moved out of her parents' home into her own apartment and got a job, which was completely unacceptable, right? And culturally, you go from your parents' home to your husband's home. That's it. There's no in between. And then, you know, your husband will decide if you're going to have a career or not have a career, or if you're going to be at home with the kids. So, you know, and we explained to her about her, her grandmother that that's a big deal. You know, she packed up, she left. She's like, I'm, I, you know, I'm going to go become a teacher and this is it. She moved out of her house. So, you know, to, to explain that that's, that's a big deal to her and for her to understand that all these strong women in history they did it because they were not equal. But at the same time, I don't want to say we handle it with kids club because we don't not, we also don't want her to ever think that she's not equal. Right. We don't want, we want to make sure that there's a distinction. And even though it's not entirely true, we want her to know that, you know, you will not have these problems. Although I don't completely believe that, but, we don't want her not believing that, that, that she's going to have separate struggles because she's, she's a girl. Mm -hmm. but, but I think it's really important for her to know that she's going to be having those particular struggles because uh, she's a woman and the truth of the matter that man is going to be, man, on a daily basis, she's going to be confronting a lot of these patriarchal issues. Men, they're going to be misogynist toward her. They're going to be um, calling her all kinds of names and so forth. And it's important for us as a parents also to provide them with an, enough knowledge that all these women have to go through this and even more, right? So I think that, you know, I, like, in, in our home, we have a very open conversations about what are my own privileges as a man walking around the streets. My privileges might not be the same privileges that, it, that a white man has, it, but it's still as a man. When my son one day is walking, I told him, like, if you are walking and there is a woman in front of you, just pause for a second and give her 10, 15 to 20 extra steps. But I yet count to 30 seconds. And he says, why do I have to do that? I'm not doing anything wrong. I say, imagine your mother, your sister walking in the evening and having a man behind them. They don't know whether the man is a nice man or not. 
your privileges as a guy that can do, do, do 11 o'clock at night time walking around the block it's not the same thing as your sister your mother or your or your aunt walking around the street so i think for him to be aware as a man about his own privilege right it's important for me to inform also about my daughter that his brother has to think in the same way, right? So then later on, not only my responsibility is toward my daughters and informing them about their own responsibility, their own rights as well, but also as a man on how to treat a woman as well. You know, so I think it's important to inform them that they're gonna find obstacles, but because there are obstacles, whether it's based on gender, whether it's based on your race, or whether you are a poor person, those obstacles are gonna be there, but what are the things that you can do to ensure that you can overcome those things? Because other successful people or other very strong people were able to do that. So I think it's about building that emotional strength for them to be able to overcome those struggles. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. I think, actually not, I think I know uh, for me personally, having a daughter was a massive, blessing um i know like a lot of parents say like oh you learn a lot being a parent I'm, i know it's true but like very i've like super hyper specific examples <clears throat> um as all three of you do and you know like i'm the same um i'm not afraid to talk about uh you know inequality justice anti-black racism these are things i was like very very passionate about um and i'm getting to a point with this like full transparency when we heard that we were expecting, um, and I can't speak for every male, but my default setting was like, I immediately started picturing a boy, a little Ryan, like a carbon copy, just exactly Ryan. Um, that's what I thought I wanted, you know, is that I think, um, and that, that, that's patriarchy. Like, I think, you know, the, the kindness and the, the, the gentleness that men need in order to effectively parent it's like there seemed to have been some issue with that. So at least if we want a boy, you know, someone in our image that does exactly what we do, that we can train to root for the same team and all of these things, you know, you're a little more comfortable uh, having this soft side that you need regardless of who your child is, what your child is. Um, and so I remember the, well, I'll just sound and I'm looking for the penis on the ultrasound and I don't see one. And nurse is like, you know, we don't know for sure, but chances are. And, you know, I had a couple like, oh. And I was thinking about, you know, the same things that these guys just discussed, you know. How do I shield her? How do I protect her? Oh my gosh, men are terrible. Look at your group chats with your boys. Like, what's gonna <laughs> happen, right? Um, you know, and I, I feel, I kinda, I see both sides of what they're saying because there's a part of me that is like you know what um you can work to be the change you're gonna have to do a lot of learning like a ton and why why i was tying in um me being vocal about racism and the things i'm passionate about is like at a point i was getting tired explaining to people who didn't understand what being anti-racist was um and i was like yo you you've got to kind of just go do that work yourself and I know for myself as a man, I had a ton of work to learn about patriarchy and my privilege. Just as Bashir said, maybe not as privileged as a white man, but as a male. Um, so my daughter having that impact on me, knowing that I had to learn something, and I could confidently also now tell people to go do work about other things, right? And regardless of it being difficult or not. So I, I thank her for that. And um, I mean, just in regards to what Tafik was saying, like, um, we watch every, and not that this is a male thing, that basketball is a male, but like, there's nothing I would have done with my son that Avery and I don't do, right? So it pulled that, that, that mask and that cloud of, you know, how I was supposed to react to whatever child I had off of me. You know what I mean? I'm not making adjustments. It, it you know, I, I lead with love with her. Um, I wouldn't trade her for a million boys. You know what I mean? God's honest truth. And, um, I, you know, it, it was such, I think, you know, we, we sometimes we really wrap ourselves so tightly around um, what we want. And there's nothing better than I think like the innocence of um, the experience of, of having children to, to really show you what's important. And, to let, and just as, as we're so selfless with them, like that last piece of pizza that looks so delicious, it has like that perfect 
you know, caramelized cheese that you would cut somebody for. And if they want it and they drop it on the floor, it doesn't even matter. Like these are the things that, that kind of roll out. And I think, um, what having a daughter forced me into learning wise about myself and what I had to change, what I had to stand up for and what I had to tell people like, chill, we can't, I, I'm not talking like that. Um, it, it's a massive gift for me, but I, I'm it's entirely selfish when it comes to her. So she can have anything for me because in, in 15 months, she's already done so much. I can ask you a question just out of a curiosity stuff. You can, you can ask me too. Uh, you can answer to like, what, what is our double standard about it? Like, would you, if, uh, you know, would you, at times I wonder, you know, the way how I treat my son, man to man, might be different for certain things than how I might treat my daughter. Because I guess you are saying we are prone to think that for, for, our, for our daughters, we can be a little bit more tender, we can be a little bit more this, a little bit that, versus our boys, we have to be in a particular way. Um, it, does those rules apply to you as well, or those are things that they don't really matter, or those double standards that are there are they there, consciously or unconsciously? Um, uh, if I could just interject for one second, something that I always say, um, and like Bashir, I, I teach uh, I teach culinary, and I always say this to my students: I will not treat all of you the same. I think that's the stupidest thing anyone can do. I will not treat you the same, but what I promise to do is I will treat you equally. So I can't deal with all my students the same way. I'm, as all of you know, I'm a sarcastic jerk 99% of the time. <laughs> but I can't be sarcastic to all of my students. Some students, they get pissed off at that. They don't want that. They want to be serious. So I will speak serious with the serious students. I will be a jerk to the students who can take it. I'll be anything in between the other students. But I will, I will treat them all equally. And I think that's the distinction. Yes, you're, you're with your son one way, you're with your daughter one way. That's fine. They're also different people. So whether they're... That is true. Yeah. Whether it was two boys or two girls or whatever it is, the boy's older, the girl's older, you will treat them differently because they're different people, but equality is what matters. Sameness, sameness does not matter because sameness is useless. Like, I'm not the same as you. I'm not the same as anyone. So why would I want to be treated the way you're treated? So that, that's, that's my philosophy on that. Um, is equality, not sameness. Never sameness. There's somebody's asking there if you are sarcastic. So I'm not <laughs> really sure. <laughs> Why will anybody think that? Go ahead, Steph. They don't know you. That's the problem. Um, I fully agree with Tafik. Um, you know, I think my son is a lot more sensitive than my daughter. And so, you know, that, that means I, I need to be very different with him, but it's not gender related. It's just their personality and who they are. And that's how I, I treat them differently. But, you know, I, I'm very appreciative of what you guys have been saying specifically, you know, Bashir is, you know, I, I dread the day that I have to tell my child that, or my daughter, sorry, that, you know, carry pepper spray, keep the keys in between your knuckles when you walk late at night. Those are things I had to do. And I dread telling her that and explaining why she has to do that. But what is what I want to commit to every single day is to not necessarily teach my daughter that, but teach my my boy that is to teach my son to be respectful and the things. And that's a great tip. Like those things are the things that my son needs to do. Um, and I think that is much more important because um, we need to be in a world where our, our daughters shouldn't be afraid to walk out at night. Yeah, um, we need some hearts for that. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think we're going to, I'm going to go to the last question. I mean, you know, I always like to end off like a very big, wild, big question, but you know, as I said, like this started all off with, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in this world and it's, this is all about creating kind humans. So if there's one thing, if you can tell this audience out there right now, like what, what is one thing that, you know, you just, the one thing you have to tell your children all the time and it's important for them to live by and to be good kind humans consistently what is that one thing you tell them all the time hmm. <laughs> Dump it all. Um, i can start <laughs> yeah you start, start mine is 100 percent empathy i i am i live eat breathe empathy through work through personal through everything you know I, you know i it is so important to me to break down why people are like 
feel the way they feel and try to put myself in other people's shoes. And that has been one thing since I've been young. Um, and I think that gets you so far and it makes those right connections and relationships. And, you know, I think for, for teaching my children, if they can do that and I, it's, it's not easy, right? It's, it's not easy to put yourself aside and be able to look at your children and be like, think, or sorry, look at the person that you're speaking to and understand where they're coming from, despite them hurting you or despite them, you know, being mean or rude. And so I have that daily conversation with them because there's a lot of times where, well, almost every day they're unkind, right? They're mean to each other or they say things that just are not right. Um, and I literally sit them down and let's just say, put yourself in their shoes, right? And, and right. I know this is very uh, Catholic thing to say, but it's true. Would like put yourself in what like what would Jesus do right like that's not what he would do so you shouldn't do it too treat others like how you would like to be treated and it's something that's mm -hmm. so simple but I think that is to me the essence of like kindness because you're understanding you know what other people are going through and trying to empathize with that right um, for, for many of the for many of the things that you're saying I agree with you um, you know the the only thing every now and then that I feel as a racialized people through Christianity, we have given the left cheek, the right cheek, the upper <laughs> under chin and the forehead a bit too many times. The so cheek. as much as I, <laughs> the, the back cheek, the back of the neck. So I feel at times because I grew up in a Christian Catholic boarding school. So that yeah. kind of indoctrination has been insulting me quite a lot. I don't necessarily fully agree, but I do hundred and 100% agree to have an element of empathy. But you know, but we're always trying to tell them, it's like every single person that you meet that day, that is in a particular way, treat them only that person, have that experience only that person. Don't, do not have the carry over on how that person made you feel for you to suddenly judge and treat other people because of that singular experience. There are a lot of wonderful people out there and there are a lot of assholes out there. So I always remind them, teach every person as an individual person. Empathy, okay? Not everybody deserves your respect, okay? Not everybody deserves you to turn your left cheek. There are people that you can choose to be forgiven, but not to everybody. Now, forgiveness is another thing that we learn, but forgiveness is also a gift, okay? Because you can forgive primarily for your own well-being and your own sake. But when people that mean to you, specifically in this particular society, do not take shit from anybody. I tell my daughters, I tell my son, you know, it's important to be empathetic, to be compassionate, to be wonderful people, but don't take shit from anybody. That's my word of advice. It's a tough world out there. Be a wonderful human being, be kind, be compassionate, be empathetic, be supportive, do all these wonderful things. But when you're finding somebody that's lucky on the cheek, don't offer the other cheek. Absolutely <laughs> not. You show them your face as well. That's my word of wisdom to them because they are out there doing wonderful things, but I need to prepare them for, you know, to be able to speak up and stand up and to assert themselves. They need to build just as much of emotional strength, also a little bit of a mental and physical strength as well. Absolutely. Don't take Bashir, shit. Bashir Absolutely. went to the same uh, parenting I, school my mom's went to. That That's my mom a million <laughs> <laughs> percent a million percent um, I love it um for me I think something that I will tell her um every day is um not to be afraid and not just not being afraid of what's going to happen or the the big racist boogeyman or of you know male perpetrators um but like every most of the bad decisions I've made if I've ever treated someone poorly, uh, if I've ever lacked respect for somebody, if I've ever not been honest with someone, most of the times it's because I'm afraid. Um, we're either afraid of, you know, being accountable, uh, afraid of how that person is going to react, afraid of ruining my rep. Um, I constantly think about uh, a, a kid who was, I was in the same class with from junior kindergarten all the way up to, to grade seven. Um, and literally every year of, of elementary school, he was bullied every year. And it was, um, I mean, everybody, you know, had different experiences, but literally he was like, the, he was the one every year. Spencer Carr, I remember his name. I'll never forget his face. I, I'd never seen him ever be cruel to anyone. I'd hardly seen him speak to anyone. And I remember 
despite never never bullying him myself, it, like ripping me every day that it would happen. I never ever brave enough um, to to tell people like just leave him alone, just leave him alone. And I, I don't know what he's doing. I, I pray and I hope and I, I he was super smart, so I'm sure his life is incredible, right? But um, you know, you think about the difference you could have made if I all I didn't hate him. I didn't want him to go through that. I was just afraid of what people would say about me if I stood up. Um, if I can raise someone who maybe not every day, you know, but some days or when it really, really matters is not um, ruled by any kind of fear. Uh, like that young lady who, who held her ground and, and videotaped um, that monster on George Floyd's neck. If, if I can raise someone like that who understands that, you know, there are going to be things to fear, but don't be fearful and don't let fear run you because I've got you, your mom's got you, your family has you. Um, I think that's one thing I would love to impart. Um, we, we, you know, I, I agree with empathy a lot. Um, one of the things that we, especially our daughter, we try to teach her is, you know, understand, and, and she's still young, but understand the limits of what you're willing to accept. Don't let people treat you poorly and continue to accept it. You've got to stop that in their tracks because, you know, at her young age, if she lets people treat her however they want to treat her, that's going to be a very, very bad precedent for her later on in life. So when her friends treat her poorly, it's like, okay, you know, either you have to have a conversation with them or maybe you have to cut them off. Maybe maybe they're not your friends. And, you know, she's she's changed schools a couple of times. Um, so she's had a problem making good friends, like she's settling in now, but because she's always been the outsider. But hey, if this is how they're treating you, they don't consider you a friend. It's time you move on. And, you know, it's hard for her because she's been not a loner, but she's been an outsider quite a bit. But at the same time, it's better that she's an outsider than to be with a group of people who are treating her poorly. And she's accepting of that treatment. Accepting that treatment is not acceptable. I hear that. Yeah, yeah. Well, look at this. Nine o'clock, right on time. Um, thank you so much. As usual, it is such a pleasure to hang with you guys. Thank you so much for sharing your stories, opening up. Um, you know, I, I love these conversations. And, you know, we're here every two weeks. Uh, this is More Than and, uh, you know, featuring the collective at Quell. Ryan will be back in two weeks to host you. Um, <laughs> And I'm, I'm unsure. I don't know. You're you're pretty good. You're pretty <laughs> good. I don't know. Have up, but uh, but it's gonna. I'm sure it's gonna be a good one. Oh, I think it's Cinco de Mayo, so it'll be a good one. Um, but anyway, thank you so much again, guys. I I really appreciate your time. Let me tell you how much I wanted to be here. You know, it's almost nine o'clock. Apart a little bit of a war and dates, I've been fussing all day long. I've been having my food sitting down and getting cold just out of a love. But it's nine o'clock. <laughs> Hey, you know, I gotta go because I'm gonna have dinner. Anyway, uh, thank you for doing this. I think it's been really, really great. Uh, Ryan, Stephanie, Tofik, much love, and uh, we'll talk soon. Okay, appreciate it. Thank, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> bye. Okay, bye, bye everyone. Bye. 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 bye.